promise of Pentecost. The promise of Pentecost. First of all, God is not a man that he should lie. If God makes you a promise and me a promise in that word, if he gives us a promise through the inspiration of the spirit and the witness of the word and the spirit, you can stretch a tightrope across hell and shout on it because God is faithful. Amen. And let me tell you, God has not changed. There are people that will say what happened in the book of Acts was only for the book of Acts, but that's wrong. Because it's not gone, it's not expired. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Amen. Everything that they experienced in the book of Acts is available for you and I today as children of God. You hear me? Say amen. Praise God. How do you know, preacher? Because I've experienced it. Amen. And I know that God is real. So today, as we preach on the promise of Pentecost, today is Pentecost Sunday. Say, what is Pentecost Sunday? Pentecost Sunday is the 50th day after Easter. And that is the day Easter Jesus was crucified on a Friday during Passover. He was resurrected the third day, Easter Sunday morning, and then the Feast of Pentecost was the next feast that would follow 50 days later. And they would come before the Lord waving the first fruits, waving the sheaves and magnifying God for what he had wrought in their life. And today we are 50 days removed from Easter and so we are celebrating, amen, the birthday of the church. Because 50 days after Jesus was resurrected, he was seen alive of multitudes of people for 40 days. And he taught them things concerning the kingdom of heaven. And then on the 40th day, he goes back to heaven. And he tells those believers to tarry in Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high with power from on high. And so 2,000 years ago today, symbolically, on the day of Pentecost, 50 days removed, you have the group of believers gathered in that upper room in Jerusalem when suddenly God, after 10 days of tarrying, 10 days of waiting upon the Lord, God invades that room and does something that the world has never seen before. The Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity, filled every person in that upper room. Amen. Up to that time, God had always been with men. But from that day forward, through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he was now in men. Praise God. And the Spirit of God lived and dwelt within men and women. Glory to God. So Pentecost is the infilling of the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So it is a gift of God and it is the will of God for all believers. Someone said, but wait. Didn't I receive the Holy Spirit at salvation? It is true that we have to have the Holy Spirit as the agent of regeneration in salvation. You cannot get saved unless the Spirit draw you unto Christ. Amen. So there is that work of the Spirit in salvation. But hear me. What happened on the day of Pentecost is different from and subsequent to salvation. It is called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The people in that upper room, ladies and gentlemen, were already saved. They were already washed in the blood of Christ and their sins were forgiven. If there had been nothing else intended for them beyond salvation, he would have never sent them to that upper room, but he'd have sent them out in the world to preach the gospel. But he said, no, sir, you are not ready to go out and preach the gospel. You go to that upper room and tarry until the Holy Ghost come. Amen. Amen. What is the purpose of the Holy Ghost? He is to empower and enable believers to be a witness for Christ and to live an overcoming life. Say amen. 
Oh, I'm telling you to be a witness for him. Here is the Bible pattern. We are saved by grace. Then according to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul said, and be not drunk with wine. There's no sipping saints. Amen. There's no drinking disciples or boozing believers. You hear me? A man that drinks ain't saved. I don't care what he says or what some rot gut religion has taught him. Hey, man, you get saved, you lay aside the filthy works of the flesh and you live right and you walk right. Hey, Amen. Preacher, I don't agree with that. Well, I got the microphone. Hallelujah. Praise God. He said do not be drunk with wine but what? Be filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. You want to get drunk, get drunk on the Holy Ghost. You want to get the blind stagger, start staggering in the Spirit of God. Let that everlasting well of the power of God spring up within your soul. The old man said he didn't quit drinking. He just changed fountains. He didn't stop dancing. He just changed partners. Hallelujah. Amen. Be filled with the spirit. That is not an option. It is a command for every born again blood bought believer. Either you are to be filled right now already with the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues or you are to be earnestly seeking for that experience. I don't know about you, but I want everything God has for me. How about it? I said, I don't want to come up lacking or slacking. I want it if God said it's for me. He said, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God's pattern has not deviated since the day of Pentecost. In the book of Acts, chapters 1, 2, and 3, we see the progression towards the fullness of the Spirit. It's a wonderful thing to be filled with the Spirit. If you tell somebody, I am Pentecostal, that means you have, theologically, you're saying, I have received the baptism of the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. If you did not speak in tongues... You do not have the baptism of the Spirit. You have a false baptism, a fake baptism, a man baptism. Because when, it's getting quiet in here now. Because when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you will speak in a language you do not know. You will utter things that you cannot comprehend nor control, but you will be led by the Spirit of God. The tongue is the most unruly member of the body, and only the Spirit of God can tame it. And only when he flows out of us in such an overpowering Niagara of soul that he takes over and commandeers our tongue that we begin to yield to the Spirit of God, and all of a sudden you're hearing words that do not make sense to you or to anybody else but it is flowing from God. It is talking directly to God and communion with God. Jude said build up your most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in tongues. Paul said I thank God I speak tongues more than y'all. Amen. There's so much we could preach on here today but we've got to move on. As you study the book of Acts and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you find there's some distinctive steps towards becoming the church that God wants us to be. And when I say the church, I'm talking about that spiritual body of believers. The ecclesia, the called out of which we are a part. Not the Assemblies of God, Church of God, Baptist, Methodist, whatever. I'm talking about the spiritual body of Christ that's gonna be raptured out of this world, the remnant. And so as you read and study the word, you will see that the first step towards the fullness of the spirit of God operating in that church is number one, separation. Separation. If you will think back, a sifting, if you will. What is a sifting? To separate one thing from something else. A separation. To separate the wheat from the chaff the goats from the sheep, that separation. You do not have to read very far into the book of Acts until you begin to see a separation taking place. Let me tell you right now, everybody is not going with us to the upper room. 
I said, everybody's not going to the upper room. And furthermore, there are some folk that don't want you to go to the upper room. There are sadly today Pentecostal churches that they allow no speaking in tongues on Sunday morning. They allow no gifts of the Spirit on Sunday morning. They allow no manifestations of the Spirit on Sunday morning. But in the words of one of their pastors, on Sunday night, everything goes. It's all out the window. Well, I can tell you the Holy Ghost is not a parakeet. He is not a pet bird that you teach how to talk and when to talk and you can keep him caged up when you want him caged and let him out when you want to let him out. Amen. He is God Almighty. We cannot control him. We are to flow in harmony and unity with him. It is of the Spirit and by the Spirit and through the Spirit. What a reprobate religion that says we not going to allow God to do this or that. Such stupidity and arrogance. But everybody's not going to go. You hear me? As you seek God, as you get close to God, there's going to come a time you got to separate from some things and people in your life. You're getting quiet on me now. There's some folks that you gotta break away from. There's some friends, young folks, you're gonna have to break away from. There's some girls you can't date. Some boys you can't date. Hello? They don't believe like you. You don't need to date them. Hello? He said, be not unequally yoked together. Amen. If they ain't going the same way or they're not open to going the same way, you better not try to hit your wagon to them. You're going to be in for a bumpy ride. Come on, somebody. Everybody's not going to go the way that you're going to go through this Pentecostal walk over the years since I was 13 years old. I have lost some friends. I have lost some associates. I have lost some, some things that, that I was part of, but I had to separate myself from them to please God. I'm not saying it was necessarily wrong or evil in and of itself, but I'm saying he also said, let us lay aside every weight. There's things that are sins and there are things that are weights. And anything that is keeping you back from everything that God has for you is a weight. You hear me? There's family that can become weights and they will hold you down. There are friendships and association. There's been things that, that I was asked to be a part of and I said, no, no, I can't do this. Why? because it is not conducive to my spirit. The most important thing in my life is the presence of God Almighty in my life and I must not do anything, become involved in anything that will corrupt that presence of God, that will pervert it or pollute it, but I must live right and treasure the anointing and the spirit of God for the price that was paid is beyond measure and he has given me this gift and I've got to realize that there is a price to be paid if you're going to walk with God in this age of compromise in this age of religious absurdity there is a price it's not he that saith Lord Lord but it's he that doeth the will of the Father listen I want you to notice Acts chapter 1 verse 15 how many did it say it said there was 120 in that upper room. Woo, great and glorious. That's a good sized church any day of the week. But now look at that scripture down below. That comes out of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 6. How many folks heard Jesus say, go to that upper room and tarry? When he's on the Mount of Olives about to ascend up into heaven, he gives that heavenly directive of where to go and what to do. How many folk heard it? He said he was seen of over 500 brethren, 500 men at one time, brother. There's as many as a thousand people or more that are standing there and heard him say, go to that upper room. But I ask you 10 days later, that's only a hundred 
120. What happened to the other 380? I'll tell you where they went to Walmart. They went to the lake. They laid out of the house of God. They always somebody say amen. They laid out a prayer meeting. They valued something in this world more than the touch of God. You better value your walk with God and your trust with God more than anything in this world. Take my health, take my wealth, take my mind if you will. But that treasure that is in this earthen vessel called the anointing of God and the relationship of God Almighty is not for sale. We're not compromising it. It's not popular. See, you've got to separate from unbelief. 500, 380 said, you don't have to go that way. They may have started out. I don't know how many started out in that upper room, but I heard him say, it's he that endureth to the end. The same shall be saved. It's not them that start out. Dear God, this church couldn't hold. And the building out back couldn't hold. The grounds here couldn't hold. All of those that's been through here in almost 29 and a half years. Many of them moved on to other churches. Why? They like somewhere a little more calm. See, a lot of people like Pentecost in name, but not in deed. Uh, there's folks today go to Pentecostal churches don't even know it's Pentecostal. Why? It's a dead and dried up. I wish somebody'd say amen. Praise God, if I go, if I see a sign that says steakhouse, best steak in the country, well, if I go in there, great God, I ain't going in there for a grilled cheese. I want a steak, you hear me? Hey, man, I believe if it's on the sign, if it's on the menu, it ought to be in the kitchen. Say amen. I said if we talk a good Pentecost, we ought to have a good Pentecost. If we say we're Pentecostal, we ought to act Pentecostal. We ought to worship Pentecostal. We ought to believe leave Pentecostal. We ought to talk Pentecostal. We ought to be people of the Spirit, by the Spirit, that believe in laying on of hands, and the sick get healed, and the devils are cast out, and souls are delivered by the power of God. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is no substitute for the presence of God. You can sit there high and dry, Lonesome and left out. Everybody's not going to get it. See, there's some folks don't like the moving of God. They, they, they like those folks when Jesus went to get Lazarus up out of that grave. There's some people. You know, Lazarus been dead three days. Jesus said, roll away the stone. They said, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not in our program, sir. That's not how we do it around here. Besides, he'd been dead for three days. He's a little stinky. That some people don't want to stir up a stink in the house of God. Amen. Let's just sit there with religious rigor mortis. Let's just sit there now. Let's don't get carried away. I hope nobody goes, woo! I hope Austin don't. Take off a running. Hmm? Come on, somebody. There was a time folks went to Pentecostal churches to watch the show. They called it a show. We called it worshiping God. Now most of them will be disappointed and said, I can get more out of Andy than I can that. You know, to some folks, some folks, little boy thought, thought that, that God's name was Andy. Teacher asked, Sunday school teacher asked, said, son, do you know God's name? Said, yes, ma'am, his name's Andy. Said, son, how do you know that? He said, simple teacher, the song says it. What song? Said, the song says, Andy walks with me, Andy talks to me, and Andy tells me I'm his own. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm trying to get some of you to laugh. You've sat there, you ain't smiled, you ain't laughed, you ain't worshiped, you ain't done nothing. You're sitting there like a cankered knot on a born again cucumber. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you this morning, brother, everywhere Jesus went, he said, roll away that stone. And he walked up there and he began to pray and he said, Lazarus, come forth. Hallelujah. Somebody said, why'd he call out Lazarus? Because if he didn't have a dead person in that graveyard, would have come out. Hell, 
glory. I said they'd have come out of there and it'd have been resurrection morning all over the world. He had to call Lazarus and your Bible said he that was dead came forth. He's a living and breathing. I'm talking about by the power of God. But you gotta separate. Amen. God's not gonna bless the holy with the unholy. He's not gonna bless the righteous with the unrighteous. You've got to make your life count for God. Hallelujah. Where'd 380 go? They went down the road, started another church that didn't demand as much. Y'all can get loud and quieter faster than any crowd I've preached to lately. Come on. Never seen so many churches in all my life. Mobile County's got probably over 5,000 different churches now. Come on. Lord, how mercy. Can't get along down here. How you think you're going to get along up there? Come on. I can tell you what it is. It's unregenerated flesh trying to operate in the spirit, and it'll never work. The moment flesh touches it, it kills it. You got to separate. Ten days. 380 gave up, gave out, gave in, and gave over to the flesh and went home. So that tells me the majority not going to want this. But for those that do, it's real. You hear me? How do you know? Because I know. I know straight from the horse's mouth because I'm the horse. Hallelujah. I ain't no Shetland pony. I'm a Clydesdale. Hallelujah. I know it's real, brother. Amen. What I feel this morning in my soul didn't come from popping no pill or drinking out of no bottle or shooting up anything in my veins. It came from a living Lord and a risen Savior and a Holy Ghost that's flowing and he's alive today on Pentecost Sunday. You just got to separate and give God something to bless. Come out from among that world. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. You can't hunt with every dog. Run with every crowd. Believe every doctrine. Come on. Buffaloes run in herds, but eagles fly alone. I don't have time to pick around with the chickens and the turkeys. I'm soaring with eagles, you hear me? Praise God, oh hallelujah. So once God gets you separated, I found out right quick about that separation when I got on the school bus that Thursday morning after I got saved filled with the Holy Ghost that Wednesday night and I went back to my usual spot at the back of the bus with my buddies and so we, they, they were sitting there and, and they said, what in the world, what'd you do last night? They were talking about what they watched on TV. I said, man, I went to church, hallelujah. They looked at me like I'd turned into a Martian because I'd never been to church as long as they had only. And I said, boys, let me tell you something else. Not only did I go to church, I got saved last night. And not only did I get saved, I got the Holy Ghost. One of them said, what is that? Is it catching? I said, oh yeah, hallelujah. What is that Holy Ghost? I said, well, it's when you begin to speak in tongues and worship God. I'm telling you, their eyes are getting big. They was ready to call the men in the white coats for me. Next thing I know, I'm having to move to the front of the bus. Praise God. Amen. They wouldn't let me stay in the back of the bus. It'll separate you, friend. I lost some friends that have been friends of mine ever since my second year in the first grade. Woo! Some of you got to get that, but I'm telling you I did. But thank God I wouldn't trade anything for what I've got in my soul. It's been high and it's been low. I've wept some hot tears, but it's been more good than bad, more up than down. God is faithful. You stay true to God, and God will bless you going out and coming in, he'll bless you and make you the head and not the tail and your cup will run over. You got to separate from unbelief. Quit hanging around old negative Nancy and discouraging doofus. Find you folks that'll build your faith. Encourage you. So once we get separated, once they separated, God took them from 500 down to 120. Seemed like Gideon had to do that. Remember, he had to separate, get down to that remnant. The next step then, after separation, is preparation. 
You know, preparation always precedes blessing. Oh, yeah, every now and then we'll just stumble in like a blind man into the blessing of God. We'll just be walking around and fall over in a bucket of honey somewhere. But most of the time, preparation has to precede blessing. Joshua told the children of Israel, prepare yourself today because tomorrow God's going to do wonders among you. See, they had to prepare. How did they have to prepare? They stayed there 10 days. 10 days until the Spirit came. What were they doing? Eating fried chicken? Playing Monopoly? Watching Andy? What were they doing? They were praying. They wasn't fighting. They wasn't bickering. They had to have the first business meeting we ever have a record of to elect Matthias to fill Judas's spot. They cast lots for that. That was a biblically accepted way. But after that day, before the Holy Ghost came, after the Holy Ghost came, the church never cast lots again about anything. Why? Because they were dependent on the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He'll flow through a spiritual people. He will speak to and through a spiritual people, a carnal mind he will not fellowship with. You hear me? That's why you can't put that banker on that board unless he's got the mind of God. You can't put that lawyer in that place of influence unless they got the mind of God because they know not the things of the Spirit of God. You, If a man's going to tell me about the Spirit of God, I want him to bend there and got the T-shirt and know about God. That's like somebody trying to tell you about marriage and they've never been married. They tell you how to raise children. They've never raised a puppy or a pig, much less a child. Excuse me, get to the back of the line. You don't have anything you can tell me. Amen. Man, we've been there and done that. I want somebody, if you're gonna tell me how to get to God, I want you to be gotten to God yourself. I want you to know this Jesus you sing about, know this Jesus you preach about and teach about, and know him that you worship. They're getting ready. Look at Acts chapter one, verse 14. These all, speaking of the 120, all continued in one accord That's not the car, fellas. They continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. There's men and women in that room praying, praying. God's bringing it all together. That's why in Pentecost we believe women preach and women can teach and women can sing. Women can pastor and women can be missionaries. He didn't have a man-only club. That wasn't a he-man woman haters club up there in that upper room, brother, with alfalfa and spanky leading the way. No, sir. It was a group of blood-bought, born-again, heaven-bound believers that wanted the fullness of God. Y'all keep getting quiet on me. That's the pitifulest clap I ever heard of Pentecostal church. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of favor and blessing. <laughs> Glory. Say, preacher, I don't believe in woman preachers. Let me ask you a question. Your house is on fire and the fire truck pulls up and it's all women. Are you going to tell them don't run in there and save your baby because she's a woman? Let me bring it down to where some of the idiots are. Are you going to say don't go in there and get Fido or Fifi because she's a woman? Personally, I ain't risking my life for no Fido or Fifi or Fufu or nothing. Just prepare to see them in heaven if they live right. <laughs> if they didn't, they toast. <laughs> oh, if they bit the mailman, there ain't no hope for them. Now, if they bit the mother-in-law, they might be some hope. Praise God. Don't tell my mom-in-law I said that. Glory to God. Don't matter. First evangelist on that Easter morning was a woman. Hello, it's getting quiet now. They're not fighting. They're not bickering. They are praying. Supplication with prayer and supplication. What is supplication? That word in the Greek means I got to hurry. Prayer for particular benefits. 
They're praying for a particular something, a particular blessing, a particular touch, a particular directive and an objective. What was that? It was when he said, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That was that particular benefit. They're wanting what he said. Listen, I can't explain it. There's things you can ask me about the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God, and I'll look at you like a calf looking at a new gate. I won't have an answer for you, but I can tell you this. It's better felt than told. Hallelujah. It is real, brother. I said it's like electricity. I don't understand the wiring, the current, and the voltage and all of that. But all I know is if I touch a hot wire, I'm going to feel a little something down in my soul. I don't have to understand hermeneutics or Greek uh, Greek uh, uh, theology or Hebrew or anything else. All I know is there's a God in heaven and his son lives in my soul. And the witness of the Holy Ghost flows through me. I am the habitation and the dwelling place of God. And by his spirit I can cry, Abba, Father. Hallelujah. He is my father. I am his child and we have a heavenly connection. Ooh, glory. Listen, praying. They're not praying for Aunt Susie's cat or Uncle Joe's ear fungus. They're praying for what he said pray for. Most of our prayers have nothing to do with God, have everything to do with us. I said most of our prayers have nothing to do with our walk with God. By the time we finally get down to us and God, we're asleep. Because we done went through 101 requests. Everybody knows somebody that's connected to anybody that's got troubles, problems, storms, heartaches. Come on. They're praying and preparing for the promise of the Father, you got to prepare. You got to get ready. That bride, she don't just show up at her wedding looking like some people do when they go to Dollar General. I'm telling you, people have no pride nowadays in themselves. Put some clothes on. Get out of your pajamas. Don't nobody want to see what kind of pajamas you got on. Great. God, you almost need some Ray Charles glasses to go around nowadays. Come on. Some folk need to wear clothes and dress up, nothing else for the Help Beautify America campaign. Might well get it all out while we're here. You say, well, I ain't coming back. Didn't think you would. But it is what it is. See, we're not fake, we're not phony, we're not facade. Amen, it is what it T-I-T is. Say amen, somebody. Amen, it is the gift and the power of God. It is available today. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, after the separation and the preparation, then comes the impartation. Boys, y'all know what that means, don't you? Impartation. That's right. Wham. When he imparts it to you, like your daddy did before he's going to whip you, he's about to impart some life lesson to you. And he always said, now, son, this is going to hurt me more than it is you. Thinking, you one crazy white man. Ain't no way this hurting you worse than it is me. I'm the one with the stripes. I'm the one screaming. I'm the one dizzy from running around and around in a circle. Like a roach sprayed with rage. But he didn't turn loose. He gave me the impartation. Hallelujah. See, when you get separated and you get preparated, (laughs) you get ready for the impartation then. You ready for God to fill you. Now, all of this can take place just like that. Okay? Okay? If it takes you weeks and months and years to get the Holy Ghost, that's not God's fault. He feel you just like that. The only requirement to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues is being saved, washed in the blood of Jesus. That makes you a candidate for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. That's the only thing. You don't have to know anything. You don't have to know. You can call Job Job. You can't name the disciples. You can, it, it doesn't matter. You can say the epistles were the wives of the apostles and be totally wrong. Amen. It doesn't matter to God. All you got to have is a willing heart open to God Almighty. Amen. God honors separation and preparation. I say, preacher, you don't have to live the way you do. I can still go to heaven. You might can. I'm not knocking that. But I'm talking about for me. There's places you'll never see me. There's things I'll never indulge in. It may not jeopardize my, my, my home in heaven, but it may jeopardize his touch upon my life. And I'm not willing to take that gamble. You hear me? I don't care how cheap the buffet is at the casino. I'm not willing to take that gamble. Come on now. Hello. You that hard up for crab legs, go buy you some crawfish. Suck on them a little while. You'll be all right. I'm going to compromise my witness. God honors separation and preparation. Did you come in here prepared spiritually this morning to worship God? You know what most folks do on Saturdays, most Christian folks? They run around like a chicken with a head cut off. They go from daylight to dark to midnight. They drag their children in at 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. Everybody's so worn out. And then they got to breathe out threatenings and slaughter to get them up on Sunday morning. Some of you may have left some of your family at home this morning because you run around yesterday and last night and the children were cranky and the wife's even crankier or the husband. And so they couldn't come to church and you come dragging up in here on the Lord's day and instead of being ready to worship, your pump's got to be primed. Your well's got to have some water poured in it. Somebody's got to have some spiritual jumper cables and jump your old dead soul off and that still had not moved some folks. Why? because they're so tired and give out. I believe preparation goes into coming into this house. You hear me? Amen. God honors those that prepare to seek the Lord. You need to prepare for Sunday on Saturday. Lay out your clothes you're going to wear Saturday night. Lay out the clothes your children's going to wear. Lay down the law to everybody on Saturday night. Hello? Hello? Be like one lady, somebody, she went to the doctor. And the doctor said, let me ask you, do you wake up grouchy every morning? She said, oh, no, I let him sleep. <laughs> you got to prepare. I'm preparing to close, by the way. Listen. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to show you what happens when we prepare and separate. 500's been trimmed down to 120. And when the day, you heard it earlier, Brother Austin, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, that's how God works. Suddenly, suddenly, boom, he does it. Bam, it happens. Somebody said, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. He said, God said, bam. It all happened, praise God, just like that. Amen. God doesn't have to have a thousand years to make something happen. He's God. He can take the wind off a gnat's wing, blow the devil halfway around the world. Praise God. I'm telling you, that's the kind of God we serve. I wish somebody would get excited about that kind of God. He's real. He's real today. He's as real as we'll let him be. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Everybody. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit, not a man, but as the Spirit gave them utterance. No man teach you to talk in tongues. If it is, you got a fake tongue, false tongue. God don't have to have anybody to teach the Spirit. He can teach you about the Spirit. Teachers can. Teach you about the nature of the Spirit. But they can't teach you how to speak in the spirit. So he falls on them. 
Listen to me, folks. Anytime God's conditions are met, the Spirit will fall. I said the Holy Ghost will show up anytime. We bring forth fruit that is acceptable to God. He's going to show up. He falls on them. They're different now. Now they're praying with power. They're preaching with boldness. They're suffering with courage. They're laboring with love. Come on, Sister Susan, get ready. They are ready. Sister Sue, they walked out of that room different than they walked in. You go back and read it, folks. From the time Jesus was resurrected Easter Sunday morning until the day of Pentecost, there's not one sermon preached, not one miracle performed, not one devil cast out, nothing was done. Why? Because they were not ready. They were not prepared. They were not equipped. They had to get equipped. Me and you trying to do something for God without the enabling power of the Holy Ghost is like a calf trying to get milk out of a dry cow. It's a lot of effort with little to show for it. Y'all know what a dry cow is, don't you? No, I can tell they don't by some of them confused looks. <laughs> Amen. Ask a farmer. Hallelujah. Praise God. There'd be a lot of sounding brass and tinkling cymbals and not much to show for it spiritually. I'm talking about the reality of his presence. God's not quit moving. He hasn't quit filling people and baptizing people. People are just not hungry today. We don't have a holy hunger for the things of God. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now lastly, a few verses down, we see the demonstration, the demonstration of the impartation. I'm telling you, when he shows up, something's going to happen. I said when he shows up, something's going to happen. You can't be neutral. You can't be a spiritual Switzerland and say, well, I'm not taking any sides. Oh, no. Amen. Praise God. You will be. You may not understand it. You'll be like the little lady in Baymanette years ago. I was preaching on a Friday night at a service up there, and this little prim, proper lady in her 80s, I'm telling you, she was the epitome of dignity. She was dressed from, from, from head to toe. I mean, she was proper. She had it. She sat there all through my preaching and the worship with her little her little bag in her lap and she was just, oh, she was just, I'm telling you, she was about that tall. She just sat there. And then we got down into the altar service or right before we got to the altar service and I'm walking over here like I did right now and all of a sudden it sounded like I heard a panther yell. Woo! But I mean, it was louder and longer than that. And I was like, great, God, What's going on? Somebody done mashed somebody's toe. And I turn around and look, and little old dignified lady, little old four foot and some odd inch lady, you barely could see her over the pew. Amen. All of a sudden, I turn around there and look, and she's standing up on her little feet and got her hands up in the air, and she's a-waving them back and forth, and she's speaking in tongues like a windmill in a tornado, and when she's not speaking in tongues, she's a-hollering to the top of her voice, <laughs> and I'm telling you, that went on for a few minutes, and then when she sat down, and, and, and she composed herself, she sat down, and she checked her earrings, everything, make sure it was all still on, and, and look, and I could read her lips from where she was at. She looked over there at her friend, and she said this. I could read her lips. She said, what in the world happened to me? Praise God. Woo, I'm telling you, man, God had already reached in there and got a hold of her down in the depth of her soul. You know what I say? Oh, Lord, send the fire again. Praise God. Give us a demonstration of Pentecost one more time. You know what this world needs to see? They need to see the fire of God back in the church. Let that church get on fire and the world will come watch her burn. They're tired of dead, dry, dull, drab, dreary religion. They want to see somebody that's got the fire, somebody that knows God, that can pray the prayer of faith, that can worship in spirit and in truth. Oh, God, where is that church? Stand to your feet this morning. Come on, give him praise. Come on, give him praise this morning. To keep a fire burning, you gotta keep wood on that fire. 
where there's no wood, he said, the fire goeth out. Now, we all not going to worship in the same way. Everybody's not going to run like Austin or buck dance like somebody else or shake a leg or whatever. Everybody's going to respond to God according to their personality. That's how God gave us our personality. You might be a weeper, a crier. You might be a shouter. You might be a trembler. Amen. You might be a million different things. But as long as you are receptive to God and let God pour his spirit out upon you. Don't gauge what you have by the way somebody else responds. Don't gauge what you've got compared to what they've got. Amen. He has something for all of us individually. Praise God. Amen. You may not get up here and carry on like me. That's all right. Praise God. Oh, I'm telling you, brother and sister, listen, it's still real regardless. Amen. How many of you want the spirit of God? Folks, we got to keep it flowing in this house. You hear me? I don't want this thing to dry up. I don't want the fire to go out. I want those little children, that little baby right there and that little girl right there. I want them to come up in the church and, and, and kids crusades where they can get the whole Holy Ghost like they did last year the little kids I want to see them get saved get filled with the Holy Ghost I want to see them like Bryce Hoven did in the old church at five years old get baptized in the Holy Ghost I want to see them like Kent and Garrett and Stephen Swinney and others did laying up in that youth camp with their cowboy boots on about 10 or 11 sound like a thunder and heard a buffalo coming through they were kicking that platform they were laying on their backs talking in tongues and rolling in the spirit. I'm telling you, brother, that's real. You hear me? I said it is real this morning. Woo! Glory. The promise of Pentecost. 3,000 people got saved that morning and Peter, they said, what meaneth this? And Peter said to them, these men are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it's not but nine o'clock in the morning. This is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. In the last days said, God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This is us. Here is now. Brother, it's our time. God is pouring it out. You want it this morning. I want you to come. Stand around these altars right now with your hands lifted. Grab somebody by the hand and say, come on and go with me. I want God to fill me. I want him to refill me. I want the presence and the touch of God. Come on up close. Amen. I want God to do everything that he wants to do for my life. Glory. Glory. Lift your hands and praise him this morning.